I'm Pastor Tom, and welcome to the Sunday Sermon. of Acts chapter 18 verses 1 through 17. Paul left Athens and went to Corinth and there he found a certain Jew whose name was Aquila who is a native of Pontus and had recently come from Italy along with his wife Priscilla because the Emperor Claudius had commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And because Aquila was of the same trade as Paul. Paul stayed with Prisca and Aquila. Prisca's, uh, Priscilla's nickname is Prisca, so that's how she shows up often in the texts of the Bible. Um, he stayed with them, and uh, Aquila and Paul worked together because they were tent makers. But on the Sabbath, Paul would go into the synagogue, and he would, he would reason and try to persuade the people there, both those who were Jewish and those who were Greek. And when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began to devote himself then completely and solely to the word, solemnly testifying to those who were Jewish that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. But resistance grew and became angry. And finally, Paul shook out his garments and said to them, your blood is on your heads. I'm clean. From now on, I shall go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and went next door uh, to the house of a certain man named uh, Titius Justus, who was a worshiper of God. Now, the leader of the synagogue at the time was named Crispus, and he, he believed in the Lord Jesus, along with his entire household. And also many of those who lived in Corinth, when they heard Paul preaching, they were baptized, believing. And so the Lord said to Paul, in a vision at night, do not be afraid, go on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed there a year and a half. Now, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, some in the Jewish community gathered up with one accord and rose up against Paul and dragged him before the judgment seat. And they said, this man persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. And Paul was about to open his mouth in defense, but Gallio cut him off and said to, the, uh, to his accusers, he said, if it was a matter of wrong or of some vicious crime, O oh Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But these are questions about words and names and about your own religious law, so take care of it yourself. I am unwilling to be a judge in these matters. And he, he drove them out away from the judgment seat. And so they grabbed on to the leader of the synagogue, whose name was Sosthenes, and they began to beat him in front of the judgment seat because he had made them look bad in front of the proconsul who didn't care about any of it. We actually uh, know about when this stuff happens. So let me, let me just kind of backstory and re remind you. So the, the, the word, um, the Greek word uh, Judean, Judean, which is used all through the New Testament, is a difficult word, word to translate because the meaning shifts and changes depending on where you are. Uh, so if you're in Judea, it means someone from Judea, right? If you're in Samaria, it kind of means southerner, uh, as opposed to the Samaritans are the northerners and the Judeans are the southerners, so it kind of means southerner. And um, 
in, in Jerusalem, there were a whole bunch of different, what we would describe as Jewish denominations, so Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, Baptists, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. When you start to get outside of, of, um, of Judea proper, outside of uh, Judeo-Palestine, as the Romans kind of thought about it, what starts to happen is you, you start to get that shift in definition where Judean takes on a, a, a meaning more like what we mean when we talk about someone being a Jew. That it, it's a, an identity that's both ethnic but religious. And so um, a lot of times when Luke is using the word, though, he kind of flips back and forth a little bit between that sort of generic way of describing a person as being religiously uh, from the religion of Israel and making a distinction between those who believe that Jesus is Messiah, Savior, and Lord, and those who don't within the synagogue group. And that's, you know, it's a struggle. How do you, without using too many words, go, well, these Jews believe Jesus is Messiah, and these Jews don't. And, and so he tended to talk, use the term believer and Jews as a way of making that distinction. And so it makes translation hard because later on, unfortunately, it leads to a lot of persecution. So it, it's important to kind of not get stuck there. And not to hear these, this terminology that Luke uses, the Jews, he really means, what he really means is the, the members of the synagogue who are opposing what Paul and Silas and the others are talking about. And so this would be the, op, the synagogue opposition would maybe be the best way to translate its meaning. It, it's not a blanket description of Jews in general. It's specific to the opposition. We actually know about when this happens. This is, this, these events occur sometime in the early 50s. We, here's how we know this. Because Luke says that when Paul meets Prisca and Aquila, they're there in Corinth because they left Rome when the emperor Claudius kicked people out of Rome. So we know when that happens, or roughly speaking, about the year 49, 50, right in there. And um, and we actually know a little bit about why. According to a Roman historian whose name is Suetonius, Suetonius says that this big uproar had arisen on account of one Crestus. And it was so bad among the Jewish community in Rome that the emperor just expelled them all. Well, Suetonius, writing from his Roman Latin point of view, he'd heard the word, but he assumed that the word he heard was Crestus, which is the, a common slave name, and so that's what he wrote. But um, pretty much every scholar who's ever looked at the text says, no, he was talking about Christos, the Greek word which means Messiah. In other words, sometime in the late 40s or right around the year 50, there was a huge dust up in Rome between those who believed, those, those in the synagogue who believed that G Jesus was Messiah, Savior, and Lord, in other words, who believed he was Christ, and those who didn't. And it got so bad that the Roman emperor was just like, get them all out of here. He didn't even try to decide who was at to blame or whose fault it was or take sides in the argument. He just chased them all out. And it's kind of significant because you get that on the other end of this, ta of this tale as well, because what happens when, when there's this attempt, let's use the authorities to get at Paul, and they drag you, Paul in front of Gallio, the proconsul, he doesn't care either. He's like, this is your problem. I don't want to hear about it. Get out of here. Um, so their frustration and rate, apparently Sosthenes is the one who thought it would be a really good idea to do it this way. And what you have then is this argument happening. Do not think of this argument as an argument between Jews and Christians. It is not. It is an argument among a Jewish community about whether or not a particular Jewish man, now I'm using the word in kind of a modern sense, a particular Jewish man, a particular Jewish rabbi, whose name is, is literally his name is Yeshua, uh, uh, Yeshua ben Yosef, uh, Jesus, right? That if this particular guy is just a rabbi or if he was in fact Messiah, that's what they're arguing about. And the argument is so bad that it leads to conflict and violence. And, and they're arguing about this stuff, and, the, and they, the, the Roman proconsul is like, why are you arguing about this? This is stupid stuff. This isn't, I don't care. This is dumb. Why are you arguing about this? And we could ask that same question. Why, why do we argue about this stuff all the time? I mean, religions argue like crazy. We're arguing about this. We're arguing about that. Why are we arguing about it? 
Why do we do that? Why do we make such a big deal out of it? If you knew some of the, some of the reasons why there were splits um, in, in denominations, you know, the, what we call the schisms, the great schisms, and why, for example, um, in Wisconsin, there's an East Koshkanon Lutheran church, and then across the street and down about uh, uh, not even 100 yards, it's probably 50 yards, is West East Koshkanon Lutheran Church. <laughs> And I said, uh, was there a split? And they go, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you knew what these splits were about, you would just be shaking your head like, I don't know, why are we doing this? Why, why do we have these arguments? What is this about? By the way, it's not unique to um, you know, Christians, uh, believers in Jesus, uh, though we've had plenty of our own arguments and disputes about this stuff. It, it's, you also find it like in Islam. We think of Islam as being anti-Christian, anti-Jewish, but actually... Uh, it, they're, they're most anti-each other because there are two groups in Islam, Sunnis and Shia, and they, they you put a Sunni and a Shia in a room and give them one knife and somebody ends up dead. It's, they, they hate each other. And so these are, I'm exaggerating, of course, but historically speaking, the, the rage between these two groups, the arguments about when we as outsiders would be like, what's the big deal? Well, it's, it's something in human nature. There's a thing we've got going in us that where we desperately want to be right. I sometimes will say, some people would rather be right than happy, which I, I consider important to remember for myself. But, but it feels like if I'm wrong, you know, I might die. Like, it's just so, it's so important to get this right. And so, you know, you see two guys sitting around uh, chatting and one of them says something about not believing in God and the next thing you know, they're ready to go to blows about, about something like that because you, you really want to be right. I must be right. Now, I thought about this problem for a long time because, I mean, I think first time I thought about it, I, I, I was dreaming. I, I was a kid. I was just little. I had a dream and in the dream, I got stabbed in the back. Apparently, I'd seen a movie that day which um, I was maybe a little more mature than I was at the times. And when I woke up, I could still feel the, where the knife went in. And it took me a while to realize the whole thing was a dream, that it wasn't real. You ever had that experience, a dream so vivid, so real, that when you wake up, it takes you a while to realize it was a dream? Yeah, when I was in college and uh, taking a class in Asian philosophy, I, I remember I mean, we were reading different um, philosophers, you know, the really important ones. And um, there's a very famous quote that I had actually heard before I read it in the text by it's, um, a guy named Chansa, who is a uh, neo-Daoist. And he says this, he says, I went to sleep and dreamt I was a butterfly, but when I awoke, I didn't know. Was I a man dreaming I was a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming I was a man? Right? See how tough that is? I mean, that's a difficult place to be. My brother had schizophrenia. My, he was adopted, six years older than me, adopted brother. He had schizophrenia. We didn't know that until, usually schizophrenia, is, you can't diagnose it until adulthood sometime. But I remember in about 1985, I think, 86, I hadn't had any contact with him for a long time. He was living on the East Coast. But he calls me out of the blue to tell me how God was speaking to him through his record player and telling him that uh, Jesus was going to be born again in Cancun, Mexico, and that this was the important good news that he had to share. Um, so anyway, he ended up, my brother ended up getting on a plane in order to fly back to Minnesota um, to visit my mom. And on the plane, he decided it was very important for him to try to divert the plane to D.C. so he could tell the president how Jesus was going to be born in Cancun, Mexico. The plane did not get diverted. It did land, land in Chicago like it was supposed to, but my brother was met by Secret Service. And after they determined that he wasn't a threat, he was just crazy, they, he, he spent some, a few days in a psych hospital in Chicago. And I remember thinking to myself, how could he know that he was that it was a hallucination and not real, right? How, how can you know? If you, have a, if you have that kind of event, an hallucination like that, and you hear God speaking to you from your record player, how can you tell that's not real? How do you even do that? 
And so I've, I've been thinking about these concepts, these ideas for so long. Now, I was raised Roman Catholic, as you know. And then I found myself um, among a group called Campus Crusade for Christ. And I had what was a very important turning point experience in my life. And I was going along then in that world of, of, um, of what we call evangelical Christianity. And a couple of years into that, I suddenly had a kind of uh, intellectual crisis of faith. I mean, literally, it was, how do I know this is real? How do I, what if I'm wrong? Okay, so you know I have ADD. You can usually tell by my preaching. <laughs> but you know if somebody says to you, for the next 10 minutes, do not think of a banana, then all you can think of for 10 minutes is a banana. If you say that to me, I can do it. You know why? Because I have ADD. I just think of something else, and then that'll lead me to something else and lead me to something. By the time the 10 minutes is up, I've forgotten all about the banana. I mean, long since forgotten. I mean, thought about it. It's like banana. Oh, wait, there was a banana back there. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> that's that's what happens. So, but it allows me to do certain things. It's like a superpower. Allows me to do certain things uh, in my head that are as if they were real. And so here I am uh, one night, and I'm just in high school, right? And it's and it's nighttime, and I'm alone, and I'm suddenly confronted with this feeling of doubt and uncertainty. What if I'm wrong? What if all the stuff that I believed is is nothing? It's ridiculous. You know, uh, how's that song uh, imagined by John Lennon? Uh, no hell below us, above us, only sky, right? What if it's like that? What if that's it? What if I, I'm, this being Christian stuff is a waste of my time? And so I, I did this sort of thought experiment using my ADD superpowers. I literally like ripped away my theology. I said, I'm not going to, I choose to not believe this. I choose to not believe this. I choose to not believe that. And I ripped everything away until I had nothing left, no faith left at all. All I had was me in a, in a, in a darkened room and I was all alone. And then I spoke into the darkness. And something really interesting happened is I felt in that moment with absolute clarity that, there, that I was not alone, that there was another there who heard me. Like at the ground, at a level that was below thinking, intellect, speech, just this awareness that there was one there who was there with me, who was there for me, who loved me, uh, and I felt the connection, and I realized that I'd always felt that connection. I'd always felt that presence of God, that as a kid in mass, uh, uh, growing up as, a, as a, uh, a teenager participating in you know, Campus Crusade youth group meetings, I'd always, without even realizing it, felt that presence of God. And that I, it was like, I, I, I understand there is one I know, even though I know nothing. I, I know that one is there. I, I know that I belong with this one, right? And that, with that in place, then I could add the theology back on top. And it made it so that I could say about my theology, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But I can't say that about the underlying reality, that there's one who hears me, one who loves me, that when everything else is stripped away, there is the one who is there. The name we use, God. And I can't deny that. And maybe I'm insane. Maybe it's a hallucination no different than my brother hearing words from his record player. But it is, for me, an undeniable reality. And so on a level that is not about intellect or speech or consciousness, um, I know that one. I know that. I know not just that there is one, but I know the one who is. Now, here's what's interesting. I, um, someone was talking about a funeral they'd been at. And they said, this is my favorite. I think it was an uncle. This is my favorite uncle. And I learned so much about it. I, had, I didn't even know, right? There's all of this. We can know a person and not know a bunch about them. But that doesn't diminish the fact that we know them. 
right? There's, there's knowing about someone, knowing the information of them, and then there's the knowing of them. We don't have good words in English for this, but in other languages they do. They make a very clear distinction between knowing about and actually knowing. And, and I realized that, you know, the theology I do, and I love theology, is, is a knowing about. But this thing, this ground thing, this thing on the bottom, this is a knowing. Also, when I was in high school, I was actually, I, I was take pictures, you know, photographers, I would take pictures. I loved, I loved, uh, actually, I loved slide film, ectochrome and kodachrome. I was so sad when they took the kodachrome away, when they stopped making kodachrome. The day they, they announced that they weren't going to make kodachrome anymore, I think I walked around singing, Mama, don't take my crow to, yeah, <laughs> Paul Simon song. But I was, I was downtown once I, with my camera. I would just go downtown and try to get interesting pictures. It was at night, so you get that really cool lighting and stuff like that. And I noticed some guys, and they were dressed like monks, and they were sort of wandering around. And I could tell that they were there for a reason. Um, they had some kind of missional intent behind them. So I stopped to talk with them, and they started talking to me about the theology and stuff like that. And, um, I, you know, they were talking with this sort of, high level that didn't, I mean, I was in high school and they're like, Rrr. and I, I, I remember thinking, I don't know a lot of what they're talking about. And so here's what I said. I said, I, I literally said that to him. I said, I don't really know what you're talking about, but I know the one in whom I have believed. Because that's really where it is. That's where it starts. That's what it's about. I am okay with being wrong but I can never get away from that fundamental truth. I am not alone. God is there. I belong to God. And for this reason, I know the one in whom I have believed. Can you find the prayer of response printed there in the bulletin? Please stand as we pray together. What if I'm wrong? What if all that I have believed is for nothing? What if I have been a fool, a sucker for a religion that is nothing more than an opiate for the masses? What if the beliefs I hold most sacred, most deeply, are just fantasies and illusions? What if I have never really felt your touch, but I have felt your touch? And if that touch is just a fever dream, there is no way for me to awaken from it. Everything in my experience, everything in my understanding testifies that you are and that you are with me. Certainly, I am deluded about some things, but I am absolutely persuaded of this. You are my God, and I am your child. Amen. to have you join us for in-person worship Sunday morning at 8.30 at Christ United Methodist or Sunday morning at 10.15 at Stanton United Methodist. And if Sunday morning is not your jam, join us Monday night, 6 o'clock at Christ United Methodist for Pizza Church. It's church and then we eat pizza. Until next time, May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the face of the Almighty be upon you. And may God grant you peace.